Hi, I'm Dr. Paula Redmond, a clinical psychologist, and you're listening to the When Work Hurts podcast. On this show, I want to explore the stories behind the statistics of the mental health crisis facing healthcare professionals today, and to provide hope for a way out through compassion, connection, and creativity. Join me as I talk to inspiring clinicians and thought leaders in healthcare about their unique insights and learn how we can support ourselves and each other when work hurts. In this week's episode, I spoke with Dr. Heidi Edmondson, a consultant in emergency medicine at the Whittington Hospital in London. Heidi actively campaigns to make well-being a thing in hospitals. And one of the ways she does this is by using creative tools and techniques. We talked about all the benefits of this and how to introduce creativity and fun into busy hospital life in realistic and practical ways. Heidi also does a brief creative exercise with me during the episode, so do grab a pen and paper if you want to take part. And do listen to the end because I have a special treat for you. We started off by discussing what the COVID pandemic had been like for her. I suspect the pandemic's been for me the way it's been for everybody else. It's just, it seems to have, you know, gone on forever. Um, It's sometimes hard to remember time of life when we weren't living in the pandemic. Um, I think it's important also to start off how the pandemic's been for me just as a person, because I think maybe a lot of what doctors find a bit stressful sometimes is we were at the beginning certainly lifted up to be heroes, which wasn't really what we thought of ourselves. So I think it's you know, as a person, I was just like everybody else. I was going through my life quite normally. I vaguely heard of something. I didn't, you know, I'll confess, didn't think it was going to be that bad. And then suddenly out of absolute nowhere, suddenly we're in the midst of this just dreadfulness that doesn't really seem to have ended. Um, I was actually in Morocco and got stuck in Morocco for the first four days um, at that point. So I think it's been difficult. Um, it's been hard at times when you, you know, my mum lives in Northern Ireland and I felt certain I didn't see her for over a year and that was very hard. It's difficult. Um, I think dealing with any form of uncertainty is difficult. We're not good at dealing with uncertainty. And I think that that's when it happens. It's it's that level of uncertainty and that level of a, of a panic sometimes. I think in healthcare, there was the phenomena that, that we were, you know, we, we had to adapt very quickly to something that we had never experienced before. And and even now, sometimes we, we discuss it's phenomenal how in, in less than two years, we can see how our approach to an illness has changed because at the beginning, we didn't really know very much what to do but now um, it was it was new it was completely unfamiliar to us whereas now it's something that is very familiar to us there has been, you know there have been movements um in different in different ways you know we, we approach it differently you know from it, it's not the same now we don't see it the same now as we did at the beginning um it's insane to think that in this short period of time you know a vaccine has come into being and we've all some of us have been vaccinated twice some of us have been vaccinated three times it's been difficult at work um you know you there's been so many different phases uh I think times you know it has been hard um you know everybody's shattered I think it's not it's that kind of chronic exhaustion of, of running full tilt it's you know it is a marathon not a sprint I suppose it doesn't even feel like a marathon now it feels like Iron Man, an Iron Man, what a strange kind of idea. Um, and we're still, or it's the marathon. What's that one through the Moroccan desert? The marathon de sable. That that's what it feels like. It's a, a a different marathon each day. Um, in very adverse circumstances. So yeah, it it's been difficult. Um, I give a shout out. I'm an emergency medicine doctor, so we saw one aspect of it. Um. To be honest, I give a shout out to people who worked in wards where, where, where they went through the journey with with people and and had to deal with a lot of 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 deaths, a lot of you know, a lot of people dying alone. And when you talk to healthcare professionals who worked in that ward, that it's interesting because that's the thing that will make them cry. They will remember individual patients that they sat with that weren't with their families, and it and that is you know that 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 will stay with them forever. I think. So, so I feel quite emotional saying that myself. So, so yeah, I, I think, you know, and it is, it is just been, it's just been this thing. And I also expect that because we're really still in it, we don't really know what it is. We'll not know until 10, 15 years time. 
or maybe longer. I don't know. I don't think we've ever really, we've never come out of it to have the reflection to understand that to understand what it was. You were trying to make sense of it as we go along and we think we're making sense of it and then something else changes and something else happens and you, you have to, you know, you have to start all over again or you have to pick up where you left off. So I, I think maybe none of us will know what the pandemic meant to us until the pandemic's long gone and it's just something happened in the past yeah absolutely I really resonate with that I think we we don't know where we are in the story you know whether we're still in the middle or towards the end and I think you're right that it's only once we're kind of safely on the other side that we'll really be able to process and make sense of of what I was saying to somebody it's like one of those long-running series that you started off like lost or something I've really you know (laughs) you just wanted to be over now (laughs) you know yes 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 Heidi I know that you've had uh, a real interest in staff well-being you know prior to the pandemic Um, and I wonder what your I mean you've you've touched on it already but what your thoughts are um in that respect, how how these experiences are impacting on the well being of staff? Yeah, so so it is interesting. So I I got I very first started to think about this back in two thousand and sixteen, which was in the world of emergency medicine terms. That was when we first began to have the the bed the winter bed crisis that that still is reflected on. And now we used to think that it was just a winter bed crisis. Little did we realise what was coming at us, but um. But but and it was in that first winter bed crisis. It was very difficult to work, and 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 there was various events happened that I really began to think of, you know, staff well being. Like many things in life, if I if I was to turn back time, I don't know if I'd even call it staff well being anymore. I might have, I might give it a different name. But at that point, it was just maybe it was the staff experience. It was it was to give a voice and a thought to, to what what is the experience of people at work and. You know, even going back then, you know, there were some very tough times, and 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 then I I began, you know, people would start to talk about it. Um, and I remember we held something called a Schwartz round, which is I don't know if you've heard of these. These are a way, a sort of recognised way, that hospitals, you know, that the King's Fund championed for hospitals of, of allowing staff to sit with their experience. And I, and I remember sitting in those, and people would just tell stories after bad shifts of, you know sitting in the cars and crying for an hour before they could drive themselves home, you know, various things like that. So I really began to think of of staff experience then and ways to I, I I think at the beginning, I'm always very honest about this, that I was making it up as I went along. So it wasn't like I had any great master plan or action plan. And I was very much I think at the beginning I, I always say I wanted to make it a thing. So in, in medicine you but lots of things you talk about education you talk about patient safety you talk about performance I felt I wanted staff staff well-being or something I suppose not with staff experience I would call it to be a thing so that that, that was the start of it and, and I began to talk and and do things about that um a, a variety of initiatives during um you know pre-pandemic and and I started up some initiatives based around fun and creativity and other stuff which I know we'll talk a bit more about later and I suppose it's like everything, the more you talk about something, it did become a thing. And then I began to talk about it all the time and people began to acknowledge I was talking about it because I was interested in it and passionate about it. I suppose I, I, I would read about it, not again in a very organized fashion, but you can fall down Twitter holes and Google holes and find all sorts of things. So I, I began to read about it and think about it more and more and, and began to have more and more theories on it and more and more opinions on it. Um, I always love a person who loves to have an opinion and talk about it so I began to develop these and um and I was very invested in it very interested in it um interestingly when the pandemic struck I can remember as I sort of alluded to the first four days at that sort of end time of March I did get stuck in Morocco and then eventually got home and I remember sitting in my living room and thinking all right this is it then for me and all my well-being stuff because how on earth is it going to stand up in a pandemic it's just not going to stand up at all. Uh, but then I realised as time went on, it 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 would stand up. Um, and I think 
you know, pre-pandemic, just just pre-pandemic, various sort of surveys, I suppose, of NH staff that they do, like the GMC survey, the staff survey, they had begun to ask staff how they were feeling about burnout and, and figures were begun. So you were beginning to get official figures from this country. The very first talk I gave in 2017 about it, I, I used American figures because we didn't have that many figures. But by pre-pandemic 2020, we had a lot of quite big surveys that, that measure things that we're all saying staff are experiencing a high level of burnout, and how that in turn was affecting both them, but also the care that they could deliver and also just holding the workforce together. So th- there was sort of information at that point. Um, I think then during the pandemic, all the problems that existed pre-pandemic just continued to exist with the added being ramped up by now we were working through a pandemic. So so the things that were issues such as workforce, burnout, all of those things that were already there pre-pandemic, they, they've just become super ramped up uh, post-pandemic. And I noticed, I haven't had time to read it before this, but I noticed the GM survey, GMC survey for this year is just out and they've looked specifically at rates of burnout, et cetera. And, and there's huge amounts of burnout amongst all, all levels of NHS staff and there's huge amounts of vacancies in the workforce. And, and that's, that's just a continuing. And it's like a like all these things, each thing impacts something else, which impacts something else. It's this kind of very tangled up, complex problem. And I think you, you were saying about wanting to make staff experience yeah. a thing. And I, I think we know that the other things that you know we talk about and, yep. and study like um yep. you know, patient experience and, and quality of care and you know all of those things are also yep. interlinked aren't they that we can't separate out staff experience from the experience of patients and of performance and quality of care and um you know sickness and retention and all of those things that that it's that is really core to no no to it definitely like is core really and it, you know issues. certainly it, just pre-pandemic just before it, were, in response to the gmc survey they then commissioned a piece of work called the caring for doctors caring for patients document which um, commissioned by most people a, a man called professor michael west whose name is quite often quoted in these conversations and he's a, a, um, a professor of organizational psychology and it, you know if, you know i have read that document um it's very long, but I did read it. Um, I studied it, and it's um. And at the beginning, he he goes through all the statistics, and it's you know quite compelling evidence that patient you know patients' experience is directly linked to the staff experience. That is one of the big big things that patients will will base their experience on is the staff experience, and also you know organisations for staff report themselves feeling engaged, et cetera, et cetera do better in all these other parameters that are measured. So so it, it, it is, again, I you make it a thing, but you also, to begin with, I thought, oh, I make it a thing. But then the more I began to read about it, I realized it was a thing, but it was a thing that was already intertwined with all the other things. So it's, it's that way, you know, it's that complex. You have to, the further back you look, you see that everything is merged and tangled up together. Yes. And Heidi, I also am interested in, in some of the work that you've done, which has been about looking after the basics as well for staff, that that, that is actually really core to the staff experience is some of those really basic things about how people meet their needs as human beings with human bodies. Yeah, so I think it's funny because, as I say, on one hand, I'm very interested in the use of fun and creativity in well-being but quite often you go on um, sort of things like Twitter I spend far too much time in Twitter there is this outcry on Twitter of you know, the, the the big one of the big kind of I suppose schisms and wellness is this outcry of we don't need all this stuff it's particularly poor old yoga that gets played don't need yoga we need the basics right and you know I don't know about it you know I agree with that we need the basics right so and if anything what is interesting after thinking a lot about well-being and wellness that the, the first actual if you like, if I had to point out milestones that moved me through this, the first actual milestone was a very basic thing. It was doctors taking breaks. And I was asked, I think it was, I, I actually remember this, it was the summer of 2017. There'd been an issue that, that that this issue that doctors were not taking their breaks. This had been come up in one of our surveys. And I was asked, could I do something about it? Um, and I, you know, the, the, the issue of doctors taking breaks is not a new problem. Right, right from the very, you know, from when I was a junior doctor, doctors didn't take their breaks. It, and, and it's something that just doesn't happen. And, and so to begin with, I was a bit 
I can't even think of the right word. I, I was not hoping to, I did not greet this task with enthusiasm, okay? I did not think, yay, I'm going to get my teeth into this. I just thought, oh, I, I can't solve this problem. And so it floated down to the bottom of a very long list of things that one day I'd get round to. And one night, I, I don't know, I was walking home and, I, and one of the other things I'd been told to do was put up some posters <laughs> to remind people to take breaks. And I what, what am I going to say, take your breaks? I don't know. And I don't know, randomly, I was walking home one night and, and this came at you know, the way sometimes you're just walking along and something pops into your head and you think about it. And then for some reason, I, I came up with the idea of, I don't know where this came from, like all good ideas, they just come. I think it was, I think it was the ancient Greeks say, do people have ideas or do ideas people? So maybe the idea people in me, that I just thought I'd have some fun with this. And I thought, well, what I could do is I could put up some, I could make posters, but I could get some commonly missed um, fractures in the emergency department. So things that are quite often missed in x-ray. And I put on it the kind of uh, sort of like strap line, if you don't take a break, you'll end up broken. And then I'll put all these posters up and I'll run it as a competition. And so it will be both educational, but I will be also hammering in to take a break. So the, so people, the idea of the competition was yeah, that people had to yeah, guess. Yeah, you had to identify. The... Well, we didn't actually let people, probably we wanted them to guess. We wanted them to go away and learn what the fracture was so that when they saw that in the department, they would recognise it. So I could also say to people, look, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, killing two birds with one stone here. I'm promoting breaks, but I am also uh, educating the doctors in the 16 commonly missed fractures. So I'm improving patient safety and education. So and the more I began to think of that, my head the more I began to yeah you know, I, I it was just I was just not doing anything so I, I found this idea quite funny and I, I got more and more in my imagination was was thinking about it and then I thought I'm, I'm going to do this I'm not going to just think about doing this I am actually going to do this this was a very important moment in my progress I thought I'm not just think about it I will go in and I will do all that tedium of getting these for things and putting them on, putting them out and laminating them, sticking them right, and promoting it. Um, so I started to do that. And, and the more I did that, I then began to tap into this idea that actually this was a problem that nobody could solve because it was one of these so-called wicked problems that are very difficult to solve. That's why nobody had solved it. And it was so complex and it was tangled up in so many other things to do with culture, to do with how we behave, probably to do with staffing levels. So actually... The posters were just the tip of the iceberg, if you like, and the, they were the kind of thing that brought it to attention. But actually, that you had to keep on and on and on talking about it. And the more you talked about it, the more you, you began to make it real. And actually, the more you talked about it, you began to have to confront what all the problems were. But but you you could do that. And I at the first time I got some of the trainees, they they always liked doing projects. And I sort of said, Well, do you want to champion this? So so they went and we took feedback on it, which was the first time it was a very good lesson for me from doing anything, get feedback. And then, you know, and then it just grew from there. So we so we've really run it now. That was started in 2017. So I've I've really promoted taking breaks all the way through that and I took I now you know talk about it we've done various posters I've written a couple of things I've gotten the BMJ about it I, 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 and what we it's interesting we, we look at different things that have helped doctors take breaks and what doesn't and one of the most interesting ones did come out from just 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 something to do with the, where we were at last year that actually when people saw themselves as a team they were more likely to take their breaks and encourage each other to take their breaks. So that was actually a very interesting thing. That actually, if you all, they, you know, and so we particularly had begun to promote this idea, particularly in things like night shift, which can be very difficult. You know, you're all starting the shift together, look after each other, encourage each other. So, so that, so that was one of those um, things we did. You know, I began to send out. I began at the beginning just to tell people that their new doctors come. You, there's an induction. And tell them at induction. Then I realised that maybe just telling them at induction wasn't enough. So I quite often send out little um like emails like saying, just come on, take your break. It's hard, I know, but it's important. Um you know, at one time the posters were all interestingly, I thought the quiz would be great, but the quiz has been, you know, some people have you know, there's there's always some people who love a quiz and winning. There's a lot of other people who just can't be bothered. Um, you know, I've always given a prize for it. It's the first person all the answers to begin with the posters were all over the department you know hidden because I thought they'd all like a treasure hunt I think that um, like yeah we've got too many other things to do um, 
invoices were all put together. Then they kept on falling off the wall. Then they had to be taken down. So then I just I just now email them to everybody and like one batch and say, these are them. You can look through them. If you want to look through them for your own education, they are commonly missed fractures as well. So you can learn what they look like. So um so so that was so that was really the first one that started. Um the other thing that that twisted and twined into was this idea of um, 24-hour food provision, uh, which is also a huge thing. If you're on Twitter, you can see I think a doctor has started a campaign about it. But again, this is, this is a huge issue. Um, we are very lucky in the Whittington that then we, we now recently got uh, this company, Meals for the NHS, provide these vending machines that are full of, you know, when I say vending machines, that they're like huge chiller cabinets so that that you'd really want to eat and you know, we, we yeah proper food um you know we got one in the in the staff room and i'm that i'm that you know it's, it's again one of these things i think there's something about food you know it, it is important <laughs> and, you know and i think it's just having that in the staff room has just you know it, it, it again you know it it it, it, it has been a, i think one of these things that has really looked, worked for people because if you're on night shift, sometimes you don't have time to prepare food and bring it in. Um, and actually, but some people, some people said to me in almost a confessional way, but I was delighted by this by saying, you know, we do three long days. We just we were exhausted. So, you know, they're always guilty. So, so we bought some and took some out and took it home. You know, and that's what we had for our family dinner kind of idea. Oh, that that's great because that is actually looking after you. Yes, after you know, three days, you are exhausted. You don't want to go home and cook for a whole lot of children and yourself you actually you can get some food that you actually might like to eat and just take it home and, and that makes life easier so so yeah so that 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 sort of has been has been one of the things that I have have done with breaks and I think there's an organizational acknowledgement of humanity in that isn't there that people aren't just you know names on a rotor and a, and a providing a function and a role they are human beings that have needs that that an organization can honor in those ways so maybe you could we could move on now Heidi to thinking about you know creativity and fun and and um how you've how and why you've brought that into the workplace yeah as a doctor you don't necessarily creativity is not necessarily something that's in your life (laughs) you you go through medical school you it's not it's not something that is particularly felt to, to be important um I had always, as school, felt myself, I liked writing. So I, it started, I liked writing, I wanted to write. So when I became a consultant, I then, for a whole lot of different ways, which I'll not go into, I ended up having the opportunity to, to be part of a writing group, which met every Monday. And in this writing group, it, it was taught, taught a, a style of writing, which is sort of called creative flow. So this is very much free writing where you given a phrase and you just keep on writing and writing and writing and you don't stop and, and do things like that. And that that became very much part of my life, I suppose I do every Monday night. I've done it every Monday night for a decade now. So so that began to to, to grow and grow and, and become more and more important to me in my life. But it seemed to have no relevance to my workplace. They were they're just two completely separate kind of things. Back in 2013, I answered an advert, um, uh, so an email we got that they were, St. John's Hospice, I think, were championing a, or were not championing, were uh, designing a course and they were wanted to pilot it. And it was to look at communication, teaching doctors communication, but being taught by actors. Because the theory is if you're a great actor, you're a great communicator. That That's how you do it. It was run in conjunction with Central School of Speech and Drama. So we all went uh, one night a week for six weeks. And we, and we looked at various different sections. And, and I find this fascinating because it, it began to appeal to that creative side of me and that side of me that had not really got any education since I'd been at school. The last module of it touched upon a style of theatre called forum theatre, which is, again, one of these things that's very complex. But to, to summarise it very succinctly, it was devised by an Argentinian, no, sorry, a Brazilian called Augustus Boal in the 50s. And he was, you know, uh, he was a dramatist, but he also became a political activist. So this style of theatre was not... As entertainment, it was this style of theatre was to go into a community and take the community's experience of a long-standing problem, make it into a play, play that to the community where the main protagonist ends up badly. 
So the community would all look at him and say, we know exactly where you're coming from because this is our life. Then the theatre director or one of the members of the company would get the audience to discuss what they'd seen and, and ask the audience, could that lead character, by changing his behaviour, have, have changed the outcome? And then there'd be quite a heated discussion and people say, well, they should have done this. He should have taken no shit. No, no, he should have shown compassion. And, and then you could go through this all. And then you say, fine. And then you start the play at the beginning, but you keep on getting audience members to come up and be the lead character at these pivotal points and see if they can make a difference. And because it's done not like in a role play scene, but in a proper acting where the actors are very invested in their characters, they know they are not going to change if they can help it. But every now and again, you can, in the midst of this drama, somebody will be able to say or do something that just tilts it and you can see everything going in a different direction. And it's also called Theatre of the Oppressed because it's meant to get the oppressed. So, so I became very interested in this and thought... This actually touches upon quite a lot of the problems that are really affecting people in the NHS because there are these long-standing, complex problems where people are coming in. And anybody, I suspect anybody who's in a system sometimes feels that the system has developed in such a way it's now not working against them being how they want to be in a system. So I ran quite a lot. I, I was lucky enough, though, again, a whole series of events that, that between 2016 and 2019, we ended up doing a, a project once a year using this style of theatre. Um, we did it with, uh, once with Cardboard Citizens Theatre Company, who are sort of quite a famous company in London. And then the other times we got a contact and sent them to school and speech and drama and they sent us master students. So that, that that was, again, sort of bringing in this idea of, of using drama, of taking problems, but really sitting with the problem and understanding the experience of the problem and, and trying to take it away and reflect upon it and watch it play out. And, and that that I became very interested in that. If we fast forward to like 2016, I was, when I was doing this, when I became interested in, in this idea of well-being and I'm wanting to make it a thing, I felt I had to, to make it a thing, you have to you have to have an action to go. You just can't talk about it. You have to create a little action. And this was this was incredibly challenging because, you know, I had no time and I had no money. And that it was it was very difficult. But what we had in those days and what we still do is we do our teaching that for 10 minutes every day in the department. Emergency departments are very difficult to stop, to get people together. You have to keep on going. But for 10 minutes a day at 10 o'clock, we tried to give 10 minutes of teaching to anybody who could come. And we called it 10 at 10. And some of these slots were empty. So I thought, right, I'm going to take these slots and I'm going to put wellness things into them. So that that, that will do that. But what can I do? I wanted to do something. And I remembered from these theatre projects, and I think this is something that I might touch upon again later, the very important thing about creativity, it's not just the product at the end, it's the process in which you go to get to it. And part of the process when you, you devise a piece, you play a lot of these kind of games that actors and actresses play that sound like they're just games. Games sound silly, they sound trivial. But actually the games are there to, again, they energise people, to connect people, to get people to bond, to get people to just be with each other in a slightly different way. I suppose one of the things, they turn individuals into an ensemble cast. So I thought, well, is that not what we want in work? We want people energised and as an ensemble cast and maybe to, 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 to be together. So in those 10 minutes, I... On the first day, I did not do this. I sent one of the nurses who'd been a child's entertainer and had done the project in and took everybody around the back. And for 10 minutes, she played a couple of these warm up games. I sat hyperventilating slightly at earth. If anything happened, how I could justify this, that I sent people to play a game for 10 minutes. Everybody came out, everybody's energized, everybody was laughing, everybody felt, you know, was you bonded. So, so I began to slowly bring that idea of games and, and we started to try to do them. The more I did them, the more I began to... It was, I did them and then it was after I did them, I began to really try to understand why they worked or what, why they should work. Because it seems very silly and trivial, but actually, is there anything behind it? And the more I began to look at it, the more I'm convinced you know, I still am. It was because there was the elements of fun and particularly laughter. You know, and you know, as I say now in lots of talks, laughter is shown to be very healthy. It reduces your blood pressure, reduces cortisol, it increases bonding hormones, inhibits your flight or fright response. People who laugh together bond together. All of these things. So it is very healthy. And again, there's that creative aspect I began to bring into it as well. That creativity is a bit. It's again, people are taught to do mindfulness, 
but you know, there's nothing magical about mindfulness. It's just getting you to focus on the present. And and some people love those mindfulness apps. Some they really work for some people. They didn't work for me. My mind was always going all over the place. But actually, a lot of these games are they're just counting games or things like that. They're sort of things that you play at parties or you know even the students at drinking games. You have to focus on the game. You can't, your mind can't be shooting off all over the place. You have to sort of focus on what you're doing in that game. It's just a very simple one when you call out each other's names in a sequence. You have to focus on it. And actually, that's just acting the same as mindfulness. You're just focused on the present. You're not worried, is the day going to be awful? You're not worried about yesterday. You're not worried about what is the day going to be awful? Is the week going to be awful? Is the year going to be awful? You're, you're just in that moment. And even breaking that cycle of, of just worry is, is why mindfulness works. Um, so that, so I, so as I began to think, well, that creativity does work like mindfulness. That That's very good. Um, as time went on and I began to read up about it, there was a big, uh, what do you call it, meta-analysis by the World Health Organization in 2019. Um, and they, and they looked at every they looked at all these papers to see does does being involved in creative activity improve both physical and mental well-being and they concluded that it does and that even being involved in 10 minutes of creative activity a day can improve people's well-being scores it can increase empathy so i i think that that was the beginning of really thinking that that these were that, that there was a space for these and, and they did relate to directly affecting your your wellness as you know being in that environment of the hospital um when the pandemic struck i couldn't really play games um for a whole lot of other reasons um but but that's when i just thought well is is there a place for this and then i, I did read there was a article by the british psychological society on how to how to look after your team in the acute phase of the pandemic and they talked very much about you needed to create a space where people felt they could express their feelings and we also needed to create this environment that we're all in this together though those things help so i thought well actually this is back to to this that there is a role for creativity in this so that was when i came up with the idea i got people to draw how they felt and that that was just for 10 minutes once a week would just say everybody could say how they felt and then draw how they felt and again some people like that some people didn't but again it was just it was all those benefits of wellness and i felt that drawing also I think anything creative allows you to be with the experience of what you were in in a way that is is easier than just asking for words. So yeah, so so that that was how it all started with, with that. And I know that you've put together a video of these drawings to to look at people's responses to the pandemic and and how um, it affected them and how they coped. And it's a beautiful animation. And again, you get a sense of. I guess, the people behind the PPE. And I think one of the things that, that struck me about that is how inclusive it feels because, you know, it, they are all kind of stick drawings and, you know, very, there's a sense of people just being able to um, express something of their experience in a way that was able to be seen by their colleagues. Um, that also feels important that being seen it, in just how you are not needing to have those filters about creating something very artistic or you know meeting any standards is just meeting people where they're yeah, at I, I think as I say if I, as time's gone on and if I rebranded it you know I also think other terms that come up now it is things about engagement and it's about there is also something that that I have I I think should I phrase this I think that one very important aspect is that, that people need or want to be seen as whole people, not just carrying out the tasks of their job. So I think there's something very important to get to allow people to be seen as whole people. And that's actually quite, you know, the next question, well, how do you get seen as a whole person? And, you know, I don't think there's any one answer. There's probably multiple answers. But I do think creativity is a sort of, process that allows people to express themselves as whole people or they let something of themselves out that is very difficult to do under other circumstances so it's very difficult to do quite often to begin with if you're just all working and you're running around and you're you're focused on the tasks of your job and it's also even difficult to do if you take people into a room and just say okay tell me I think you have to do more than ask people 
just talk about how you feel because some people will talk some people won't talk some people will not want to talk some people will start to talk but but they'll not get to the core of it so there's something if you give a creative task it levels the field for everybody and then people can express something of themselves that that is harder to express in normal ways and then it does touch upon things and as you say those stick drawings it sounds ridiculous but some of those stick drawings made people cry oh it made it made me cry watching that watching the videos so you see some of those stick drawings and they make you cry and you and sometimes somebody will look at it and sometimes somebody will draw something and everybody will look at it and go and then that will that person will sort of say something and then it and then it just inches you along to seeing people in a different way and and I think to me that is vitally important both pre-pandemic in the pandemic because I think ultimately it is these moments of humanness that are incredibly important to everybody in the job they're incredibly important to patients the more you allow that humanness out the more it sort of connects people I think and and the more and once it starts creeping out it keeps on creeping out. It doesn't go away. The more you allow it to happen, it slightly becomes more and more and more human. And and even I think when I did it, I I realised that I'd put down so many layers, if that makes sense, about my humanity in a way that I didn't bring to work, but that that slowly began to erode away and and came into more and more of what I did at work. So that's what became incredibly important to me. And so important, I think you talk about connection there, particularly in this context of this pandemic where disconnection has been such a thing we've had to grapple with in terms of, you know, social isolation and, um, yeah, you know, PPE and, and seeing each other as, as threat, you know, other people become a threat rather than a comfort in our lives, no matter whether we're going to the shops or going to work or um, so that sense of being able to connect that's a really helpful antidote to that. Yeah, I think it is. But I think there was a huge thing. And I think even if you think of the, for society at the beginning, the need to go out and clap healthcare workers, which I know is a very <laughs> controversial thing. I always, you know, and I know lots of people have views in that, and lots of healthcare workers have views in that. I didn't really see it as applauding us as heroes. I didn't think that's what it was about. I felt it was about communities wanting to connect around something. You know, they were applauding themselves. They were applauding getting through it. They were applauding humanity, really. And, and I think that that was why I think it was important to people. So I think I think there was a moment that you need to connect. And I think it is very, very important to people. Just one other thing about connection that I think is quite important to say is if we go back to uh, Professor Michael West and that you the paper caring for doctors, caring for patients, he talks a lot about this idea that that you know you're motivated in work. There's this kind of intrinsic motivation, and it comes from you know to to, to sort of in, to, to to get that in people. What people really want is they want autonomy, so they want to feel that they're seen and they're heard. They want to feel connected to other people, and they they want to feel competent they're in a job in which they're competent and progressing. And actually, if you provide those things to people, that's what that's what people want and that's what motivates them and I remember actually it was doing a workshop with the forum theatre I I, I was with some of the nurses and we we did this we did these series of workshops and and one of them they they were talking about uh, we were were looking for something to make a scene for a bad day so they were talking about a bad day and at the end of that conversation I said well what what gives you a good day what do you want at work what gives you a good day And, and without any pro- nothing this conversation organically grow for one went well i i think it's important i i like to come in and feel i've really connected with my patient you know you have a chat with them you sit with them you hold their hand for a bit that's what's important and somebody else said yeah and and and, and i like to feel that we're seen and we're important and what we say is valuable and somebody else said and, and i like to think we're doing a good job and we've scoped to progress through our job and i, th- I thought oh my God, they have just actually demonstrated that and i remember saying to them semi jokingly so none of you have said to me you want more money and they all sort of looked at me I mean, and everybody started to laugh. Now, again, this is not some sort of plea that people don't need money. But but actually, one of them said, look, when you have a really bad day and it's awful, you want more money to compensate for having a bad day. But actually, you just want a good day at work. <laughs> and, and, and that's what makes a good day. And I think that 
and I think I have you have to keep on coming back to that because it's it's very hard in the midst and it's very stressful and, and society's stressful and everybody's working incredibly hard. But sometimes and, and you think, oh, well, I, what can I give people? But actually, and sometimes you think you need to give people a lot. But actually, if you come back to they they want to feel they're seen and important. They want to feel they've connected. And I think that connection is so important to people. Or, or maybe not everybody, but a lot of people, they like that connection. And, and that's such an important thing to, to, a valuable thing, really, to do. And I certainly hear, as you say, not just for people having a bad day, but when things start to get chronically difficult, you know, and a real struggle with kind of going into work. And it absolutely is those things like, you know, that sense of um, not feeling able to contribute in a meaningful way at work feeling um, kind of disconnected or emotionally cut off from, you know, maybe not having the capacity to to foster those connections anymore. Um, and yes, to not being seen, not being valued. Um, and that can be very basic things, you know, just not having breaks or space or time. Yeah. And I was thinking, Heidi, about when you were talking about the, the creativity and the benefits and a couple of things that really struck me was um, about how the experience of, of having creative time and creative spaces in your day can, on an individual level, really help to calm the nervous system. You know, just having that little bit of time out to um, recover particularly in a very hectic work environment and you were talking about you know the impact it can have on stress hormones and the the you know fight flight system and we need our nervous systems to be calmed in order to maintain connections with people so in order for us to be able to have a compassionate human connection with colleagues and patients we need our nervous systems to be calm so um I can really see how creativity can it is quite a quick access way that you know you as you said you can take a 10 minute snippet of the day in order to kind of cut out almost the um you know the logical kind of language filtering process that we go to and and um feed straight into our nervous systems in, in that kind of playful way. And the other part, I guess, that you've been talking about is the communal connection that that can offer. So there's something about the creative process as an individual that can be really helpful, but doing it in a communal way can have all sorts of other benefits, as you were saying, in terms of bonding as a team, you know, understanding each other better and something about, I guess, cutting through hierarchies. See, this is the other thing I'm really interested in because I only began to really think of this as I was moving in, well into the project. So the other big thing that comes up again and again and again is what makes a good team? So, you know, what makes a good team? What's the most important thing in a team? And and something that comes up now a lot is this concept of psychological safety where and I think Amy Edmondson's the, the woman that has written a lot about psychological safety and, and done a lot of things. And it's this idea psychological safety is important because it's this idea people 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 need to feel safe to say things they need to safe to come up with ideas they need safe to 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 do things and that that's important both in an acute situation where you know you, everybody needs to to be able to say something the airline industry I've do some work with the airline industry now and they will talk about you know people everybody needs to be empowered to speak up if they think there's a problem it shouldn't just have to go through these hierarchies and I think in longer term things not just in in the situations emergency situations just in looking how to develop a place solve problems move things forward everybody needs to feel they're able to speak up and I'm very more and more interested in psychological safety, and and I've noticed it's beginning. It's coming into some emergency medicine forums. They they I saw an infographic about how psychologically safe is your team, um, and 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 so it's becoming more and more talked about. And again, how do you, how do you create psychological safety? Because you can't just go in and say, okay, everybody, let's make let's be psychologically safe now. I'm I'm senior, but I need you to just everybody in this team, even if you're a day one very junior, you all have to feel 
safe. It probably doesn't work like that. So I think I definitely think there was something about taking everybody and making everybody in the team play a game together because that flattened the hierarchy. Everybody slightly nudged out of their comfort zone. So everybody slightly in that kind of, but in that healthy place, because you can't, you know, you have to do it in a certain way. Everybody feels slightly, mm, I mean, say I'm going to play a game. You can see some people going like, hey, games, and other people thinking, oh, no, please not. But everybody slightly pushed into this slightly unknown area. So everybody's leveled and everybody's starting to connect with each other in a in a in a different way. And I think that's quite a healthy place to be. And I, and I can see it in a kind of microcosm because I've actually one of the things I've done since the pandemic to 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 progress the work is I I don't know if you've heard about Project Wingman, who were the furloughed airline staff that come in and set up waiting rooms or first class lounges in NHS hospitals. We had a lot of conversations with them just because they were there. And then a group of them have formed a company called Wing Factors that I've now started to to work with. And together with them, I devised a it was not there's a lot of work in, in medicine with the sort of kind of pilots, which there are some of that work wing factors do, but I work particularly with the cabin crew to create a, a communications course because we worked out a lot of the challenges that they have in communication are the same as ours. So it was we were looking at specific things that we look at, how to create a good first impression, we can't give you what you want and and um how to sort of I can't think what's the word, de escalate problems. So so I've devised this course with them, but I interspersed the those modules with some of my more wellness games. So you're getting people to play the games because I also think it's communication is actually connection. The key to good communication is just good connection. So so I feel that those two things sit well, and it's been a, it's been a fascinating thing. I love doing this. You know, I've built up. I just love it so much. So we we do this, and then also. In the end, we have to do in the afternoon, we have to do some form of the, as they say, the dreaded role play where we get people to do that. And I, I use a bit, I try to make a bit more forum theatre like. And I also think people are more open to being in these kind of practical things because they're not just a group of, of semi strangers who've sat in a room together and listened to somebody talk. They've moved around, they've interacted, they've played games, they've all been pushed out of the comfort zone together. So they all move into this kind of acting out together more easily than they would have done if if we had not done this. Um so so yeah that it's been a phenomenal experience to do that. And I've run about nine of these courses now this year really. So that's been very good. So Heidi, I wonder if that's a, it's a good point to maybe think about how practically we might be able to use some of these ideas, um, both as individuals, but maybe um, something we can bring into the workplace if, if people are excited about these ideas. Yep, certainly. So I find drawing helps. So this is, again, so if you say the word drawing, again, some people go, yay, probably very few other people will look horrified um so you can do this at the beginning of any kind of meeting you can do this at the beginning of a teaching session you can do this at the beginning of a board meeting and like all creative things it will have a product but it's the process and the process might right it's better i think like exercise you know the way if you do your lack of exercise you're still burning that your metabolism still working afterwards so get you into creative zone which is quite good that's where you want to be in a meeting so for drawing it's very simple and people will people will be horrified and look at you so the first thing if you want to do this you have to you have to just brazen yourself through it so you say okay everybody I want you to draw something simple good idea if people are really unwilling tell them to draw something simple I always say a cat because cats are simple to draw okay I'm gonna do this along with you Heidi draw a cat please with your dominant okay. hand okay okay Gosh. No, okay. Remember, you don't even have to show you. We're in a podcast, so nobody's even going to see your cat. I, don't know what it looks like. <laughs> I might be brave and put it on Twitter. Because you were doing that, did you feel anxious when you were doing that? Because, you know, it doesn't matter. So, what you now have to do is take your non dominant hand and draw the same thing or try to draw the same thing. Okay. <laughs> Now, quite often what happens is when you look at your two cats, 
Although the non-dominant hand is obviously all shaky and funny and a bit strange looking, there is something about it. In a lot of cases, it looks a bit more charming or cartoony, or maybe it's the shaking. It makes more alive or something, but they do look more alive. They look more funny. So then the final one to really go for it is look at the paper, then close your eyes and draw the cat again with your eyes shut. With my left, with my uh, dominant non, or non-dominant? I don't want to say dominant hand. You could go for it with your non-dominant. This is art. There aren't no rules. <laughs> You could draw it with your foot if you wanted to try it that way. You're like, <laughs> already you see, okay. you're exploring all the numerous potentials <laughs> already. Uh, okay. I mean, it probably looks completely strange, but it also does look like like Picasso or are you one of these kind of, um, Mira, was it that? It's just all Yes, Mira, yeah, shall yeah. I show I you? Can't see, I can't see it very well. Oh, yeah, yeah. You look, yeah, you look like, move it up a bit, I can't see, oh yeah, the bottom, um, but you see that it is true that the, 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 the non-dominant hand always becomes more charming, and then you, you did quite well, but it's still quite funny, that sort of slightly out of kilter uh, funny cat, and then, yeah. then you can, you can show those, now, you could just do that at the beginning of the meeting for five minutes, and, and there's a lot of science, I think, behind doing some form of icebreaker at the beginning of a meeting, again, to get everybody into the room and everybody in the same wavelength. If you wanted, if you wanted to do it, and then you can just move on to what you're talking about. That took, what, three minutes? It's absolutely no time at all. And it just is done. And then everybody's a bit of a laugh. And then, then they're probably, you know, there's no time lost. You can laugh and then still have a serious conversation. They are not mutually exclusive to each other. And actually, if you've laughed, you're probably a bit more creative now and you're a bit more open to, to new things. Other ways you can take it, if you want to do a bit more of a wellness session, you might, then I've moved on from that. I've drawn on to something that would make you happy, something that you want, something like that, what you feel you need. And then you can see and, and that can, and then you can discuss them. Another one, if you want to take drawing, that's quite a good exercise that I use. And it's I use this quite often with the doctors as a communication exercise is you divide the doctors into pairs and they, they sort of are back to back with each other. And I've done it on a Zoom meeting, which it works. You put them all into, you know, you can't see what you're doing. And you tell one doctor in the pair, you say to draw something, just a very simple something. Don't tell anybody what it is, draw it. And then the trick is then you then to your partner, you describe what you've drawn and you see if they can replicate it. And then you again compare them. And I think this is, I use this as a very good exercise in communication as well, because it sort of highlights the point that even when you're communicating, you might have an image in your mind that you're trying to communicate, but actually how that other person sees what your words are, there is quite a big gap. So, because I always think another thing about communication, it's not just what you're saying, it's how it's being understood by other people. So I think I use that, and it's quite a fun one. And some some people some people end up with things that are almost identical, and everybody is a bit like, "Wow, how did you do that?" And then other people don't. But I think it's just another good exercise if you want to to just highlight something and do something a bit different. Mm, so creativity as yeah. a tool for yeah. achieving other things like improving yeah. communication, yeah. problem solving, um, as well as having a, a real wellness yeah. benefit. I think that. also problem yeah. solving is another interesting aspect of creativity because this is what I've become to believe more and more. You know, the, the, another big buzzword that you read about from the problem solving is this idea that a lot of problems are these, they describe them as these complex, wicked problems that are problems, and a wicked problem is one that just can't be solved. But what you can do with a wicked problem is you can make it better. So instead of trying to solve it, you constantly try to make it better. And they talk about you need an emergent process to make it better, where you have to sit with the problem and gradually work work your way out. And I think I think that's very similar to a creative process. You don't, you know, in the creative process, you sit with what you've got a lot of times and you, you're just trying to develop and work forward. And, you know, somebody said about writing, it's, you know, when you try to write something, you know, it's like you're you're driving along a dark road, dark foggy road at night, and all you can see is what's in the light of your headlights, and you just have to keep on moving in the light of your headlights and trust you'll end up somewhere better at the end of it. And and I think that's what you do in the creative process. But I actually think that's the process you need to really tackle these complex, wicked problems. You can't solve them. You can't think of I want to be at solution B and work my way back, which is how you solve a simple problem. We do that. A lot of these problems we're dealing with. That that is there is no place B to work yourself. You just have to 
you're trying to get yourself each day into a better place. And I think it's that creative process is very similar to that emergent process that you have to, to use. So I think it's another reason why creativity is important, because it's something to do with a mindset to tackle things that are very difficult to tackle. Is there anything else on, on these issues, Heidi, that I haven't asked that you wanted to? Um, I suppose maybe the final thing is, you do I believe in creativity? <laughs> um, I really, well, so probably my final story would be, or, or maybe thing would be that probably at the beginning of the pandemic, as I say, I've alluded to this, I was... Uh, I was on holiday. I was in a, my friend's creative writing retreat in Morocco. Some people probably we laugh about why we thought this was a good idea to go, um, uh, but we went. And on the fifteenth of March, we were in Morocco, uh, and it was the Morocco shut their borders, and it was incredibly stressful. You couldn't get in or you couldn't get out, and there was this incredibly stressful four days where we had to try and and get out of Morocco, um, which is <laughs> a bit ridiculous, but it was it was very difficult. And I was looking on all my emails, so I could see my work emails in the mounting, rising pressure about what was happening at home. So I was trying to get out to somewhere at times I didn't really seem to think sounded that great either. Um, and it was incredibly stressful. And I remember my friend who was taking the creative writing retreat, she was doing a lot of phone calls. And then every afternoon she would say, we came here to write, now we're going to sit and write. And um, she handed over to her husband at home. He took the baton to make all these phone calls about how we could get out. And to begin with, I think we can't possibly write. Well, how can we be doing this? We're in this awful situation. We can't just sit here and write. This is ridiculous. And then I realised, what was I going to do if I wasn't writing? I was just going to sit there and worry. I couldn't stop. You know, what? I didn't have time to write because I just wanted to, you know, all the time and worrying. So I was pulled into this you know, we were made to write and, and you could feel it. We were resistant in our minds, but then we'd get into it and it, it, and we did it. And it was this very much this, what we call, you know, she calls creative flow writing, where you were, you know, you start off with a random word and you play with things and you just, you're told not to stop, to keep on writing. Don't worry about what you're saying. It can be nonsense. It can be rubbish. Just write, 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 write. And I, and I, I find this did keep me going through that four days. So when I came back and I, and I, arrived back in the pandemic and it was you know that was back in March 2020 it was very stressful and it was also we use the word stressful maybe another word that we should use it it was frightening we were all scared you know and I think that's very important everybody was very very scared so it was easy to go home and be scared and then do all the activity you do when you're scared you know to to start I don't know just googling things and then falling down the twitter hole and I thought right I can't do this so I started I decided I would write a hundred words a day and and I set myself that task I'm going to write a hundred words a day and um I did write a hundred words I had a short story and you always end up writing an idea for a short story and you always end up writing more than a hundred words so I, I did and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and then I discussed it with various people that I know because I, I, you know, I do a lot of creative writing. Um, you know, I do a work a class every Monday night, and I have my other friend who does creative writing workshops, and you know, they were both very supportive, and I did a lot of work around that. And then they said, one of my friends, why don't you turn it into a novel? And I thought, well, I can't write a novel. <laughs> you know, it's a short story. I can't possibly write a novel. And I thought, right, I'm going to go for this. So every day of the pandemic, I've got up before I went into work. And I wrote a hundred words of this novel. And then when I days off, I, I put it into longer bits and chunks. And I finished it in the summer. So I've written a 165,000 word novel during the past. Now, it's being edited. Um, what, what will happen to this novel? I don't know. But I still think sometimes I look back and think, oh, my, I cannot believe I wrote a whole novel during the pandemic. But I did. And it, it's not, though, the product that, that, again, it's not the product. It was the process. And that process, I think, was one of the things that really kept me going. And that was my time in the morning. And I created a world that I went into that that I didn't think about everything that I was scared of. And, and I did it. So so I I, I felt that I, I, I developed my own creative practice, which did help me. So you know, other people might think it's it's not going to work, but actually having a creative practice really, really helped me go through it. And 
and in the evening I, I started I didn't you know I started to draw a lot from you saw the you know stick figure thing so I started to actually draw out presentations so instead of you, know, you have to prepare, prepare a lot of presentations for work so instead of writing slides I, I drew them and I got more into that so certainly what kept me going during the pandemic was a was a creative practice so, so whatever you know that, that that did work for me and I suspect it may work for a lot of people and you hear about other people, you know, that's why I think all these things like baking, you know, so, you know, lots of people did reach for that kind of creative practice themselves. And they may not have thought it was a creative practice. They may not have termed it a creative practice. They may have been poncy. No, I don't have a creative practice. Do you like to bake? Oh, yeah, yeah, I like to bake. So, so I think there is something that, you know, I do believe in the process because it also helped me going as well in my own personal life, not just work absolutely for me it's kind of knitting and sewing and just making stuff all kinds of things and I, I I do know that um if I don't have that in my life I start to not feel very well it's a real it becomes a real gap and it's definitely a go-to process for me and I think what I love about what you're saying both in terms of how we could infuse creativity into our personal and work lives is that it doesn't have to be big massive projects it can be little ways of sprinkling it through our day in in small chunks that do feel manageable and are realistic even within you know the the hecticness of of working in the NHS through a pandemic there are still ways of of being able to find little pockets and little ways of of bringing creativity yeah and, and, and I think you know at, at the you know the height of often it was really bad and you know at one time but last year um you know you, I couldn't even do these 10 minute sessions you know that that wasn't conceivable even that that was too long there was still this what do you do what do you do and and, and then I, at the beginning I, I then when I was the consultant you know that started at eight o'clock in the morning you have to start the day I, I sort of became felt it was very important to, to get everybody who was starting the day to just have everybody stand for a moment for one moment for people to take down their masks so we could see each other's faces and then the person to say you know say their name and, and it, it sounds bizarre but sometimes you have so many people you, do, you don't really know each other's names say their name and, and what their role was in the department and this this and, and even if you go around that it's one of these things you always think oh, we don't have time for this or this is ridiculous we need to start you know it takes two minutes and and there, there's a kind of rhythm and there's the fact that you will stop every day and you develop that rhythm there is something quite connecting about that and time you know it it's you know, then sometimes recently, because we, we've done it so often, everybody knows everybody's names now very well. So then I, one day, you know, this was, you know, this was about a month ago, but you know, it wasn't, we weren't quite where we are now, but a little bit more time. I said, right, just say your name and tell me if you had one last meal to eat on earth, what that meal would be. And that sounds a very basic question, but actually this is a, this is, a, that is, I think one of these most incredibly sort of joyful connecting questions because your relationship with your last meal and food is more than just food and eating. And it's to do with family. It's to do with memory. It's to do with happiness. It's quite often to do with home. It's quite often to do with something your mother or your grandmother made you. And actually, even for people to say that, and particularly if you work in a sort of a, a multicultural workforce, there's something very uplifting that people would say, you know, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll have my mum's, you know, my mum's, you know, somebody said I'll have my mum's steak, you know, my mum's shepherd's pie. And the next person said I'd have my mum's, you know, chicken curry. And then somebody said I'd, I'd have jollof rice. And then somebody else said I'd have my mum's rice and peas. And, and, and then there was something about it that, that just, again, it's just these little connections that remind us that we're human. That, that actually, I think people do value and it just starts them in a very slightly different place from where it would be if they were starting from that place yes and just being seen as you said literally literally and uh figuratively and I know Heidi that um I follow you on Twitter and that's probably a good place for people to connect with you. And I really appreciate your Twitter feed because it is a joyful, colourful um adventure you know you post a lot of beautiful artwork and lovely food um and I imagine that's also part for you of of kind of keeping going and, and keeping connected with with some of those joyful things that life can offer even in the midst of yeah no no it, and it is and, and sometimes you know like again I have to say I've had a bit of it the last few days I thought you, you really don't want to look at 
anything to do with the news or Twitter. You know, it is, you just sort of feel I don't want to, you know, sometimes think I'm not going to look at it. But I do think it is important. Um, yeah, I do, I do think there is something important about doing it. And, and and there's something that to me there is now sort of importance of just looking at those. And, and you know, and I always try to post at least one or two pictures or or, or artwork or a recipe. Um you know, I, I'm not, sometimes I'll just go on and do that and then I'll get out again. I'm not going to start to read all the other stuff because you can just go down that Twitter hole. But I think it is just to have something, you know, and then and then even in the midst of, of you know, even all the time in the midst of it, then somebody, you know, there will be something that will be quite funny. <laughs> some, some people find some sort of like slightly hilarious thing um, or such sort a of ridiculous thing that you just do, you do sort of laugh. And I really think that is quite connecting. So it's, um, I suppose it's the dark side of social media versus it's still its positive points well thank you so much Heidi it's been lovely and very inspiring it's been lovely thank you for asking me (laughs) I hope you enjoyed this episode and that you feel inspired to think about ways of bringing more creativity into your work and life I'd love to see your cat drawings so please do post them on twitter and tag me at dr paula redmond I also have an extra bonus treat for you to say thank you for listening and supporting the podcast And also because today is Inspire Your Heart with Art Day. I've teamed up with Kath James, who's an amazing anatomical embroiderer, and we've put together an exclusive free bundle for listeners, which includes a simple embroidery pattern that's suitable for beginners with the motto, do no harm, but take no shit. It also comes with video instructions and guidance from Kath on mindful embroidery. I'm really excited about this because I think it embodies creativity and fun, but also a really important message about health professionals taking a stand for their well-being. You can find out more and download it at drpaularedmond.com slash do no harm. Please do share your embroidery projects with me. I can't wait to see them. But until next time, take good care.